Hi, everyone. Welcome to the 5-Minute MPA podcast. I'm Kim Hefner, board-certified family nurse practitioner and menopause specialist. And I have Dr. Uh, David Toman here with me, nootropics expert. And I'm just going to welcome him and go from there. Hi, David. Um, hi, Kim. It's good to be back. It's great to good see to you. Good to be back. Thank you. I'm looking forward to talking with you today. Um, so excited because all of the information that you provide on your tropics and supplement guidance is all evidence based. We were just talking about how you provide peer reviewed studies on all this. So you are the go to expert truly on this topic of sex hormones and DEGA. I want to start with learning about you and who you are and what you do. Okay. Um, I'm the author of nootropicsexpert.com and the in my youtube channel which has become very popular i've got over 120,000 subscribers now which is kind of awesome um got an email yeah. list of a few tens of thousands of people nootropics expert is ju is the world's leading source for supplements that help the human brain and all nootropics are are dietary supplements that enhance or optimize the human brain one way or the other and the word nootropic was um, coined by a guy named Dr. Gugeu, who was a Romanian psychologist and scientist who was working with Dr. Pavlov in St. Petersburg back in 1962, I think it was. And they came up with a derivative of GABA, and it's called paracetam. And they were looking for something at the time, I believe it was for motion sickness for the, um, for the astronauts, for the cosmonauts in the space program when it was just starting. And so they came up with paracetam. It's perfectly natural, derivative of GABA that we naturally produce in our gut. It's perfectly safe to use. Uh, it didn't help with motion sickness, but they find it had improved cognition. And they went, oh, okay. So they made a drug out of it and they still prescribe it in some Eastern European countries for things like Alzheimer's and, and uh, cognitive decline and stuff like that. And then other companies caught wind of the success of paracetam and they started making other derivatives of paracetam. And for example, oxyracetam and anaracetam and phenylparacetam. And, and so Dr. Gugay saw what was going on. He decided in 1973 that he wanted to name this class of compounds. And he came up with the word nootropic. Uh, new is from the Greek for mind, anthropane, to bend, so to bend the mind. And then he came up with a list of six different criteria that a nootropic must meet for it to be considered a nootropic. And essentially it boils down to it's got to be non-toxic and safe to use. Yeah, um, so nootropics are dietary supplements. They're not smart drugs. So modafinil and Ritalin and Adderall are not nootropics, no matter what you read in the press. Um, I consider those smart drugs. You need a prescription to get them. Nootropics, you don't need a prescription. And I've reviewed individually 102 separate supplements that help the human brain, which you can find on my website. Um, I review each one in depth, I, what it is, where it comes from, um, how it was used traditionally, if it does have traditional use like Ayurvedic medicine or traditional Chinese medicine, uh, the different things that it does in the human brain, um, what it feels like when people use it as a supplement, dosage recommendations, clinical studies backing up everything that I'm talking about, uh, side effects, if there's a potential for it to be contraindicated with any meds that you're taking. And then I often recommend a brand to use because I'm really fussy about the supplements that that I recommend. Uh, yeah, and that's then so I, important I, I, I've published a couple of books. Um, well, The Secrets of the Optimized Brain is free. You can get it just by subscribing to my email list. Uh, and then Head First, the second edition just came out recently. And Head First is 962 pages. It's a it's a it's basically a repair manual for your brain. And yeah. you can get that on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Belbo Books, Walmart, uh, Apple Books, any place that sells books, you can get a, your copy of Head First, the second edition. Hard hardcover, um, paperback, or for iPad or Kindle. It's about so, this thick. <laughs> yeah, it's I well, like a Bible. It's, almost, it's, almost it's an pounds. incredible. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like it's it's awesome. Great resource. So evidence based. I want to talk a little bit about you specifically. What is your why behind nootropics? Why did yeah. you personally get involved in it? 
I kind of stumbled into nootropics before I ever heard the word nootropic because I was, I had a problem with focus and uh, being able to focus all of my adult life. I mean, I've, I've got a marketing degree, a business degree. So wherever I went in the world, I ended up in some executive position. And every year when you're in that kind of position, you get a performance review by your boss. And the boss said, would, every year would sit me down and said, David, you're a fantastic manager. You're a great executive. People love to work with you. You're a good salesperson, but you've got to learn how to focus. And so I went out and I bought the books on how to focus and I bought the books on how to be a better executive, but I could not get it. And I just thought it was a moral failing. And this went on for years and years and years. And then I, um, I moved up from the Caribbean and to South Florida and um, for, in Miami. And, and I met this gorgeous blonde girl on, the, uh, on North Miami Beach about 18 years ago now. And um, instantly fell in love. And within six months, we were married and we're still very happily married. And, but she saw what was going on the first year that we were together. And she said, there's this psychiatrist in Palm Beach that I want you to go and see. And he's one of these guys that he's just, he's a rock star. I mean, he's just, he's brilliant. So he sat me down and within 10 minutes, he diagnosed me adult ADD and PTSD. And so for ADD, he prescribed Ritalin. And the very first day that I took Ritalin, Kim, it was like somebody turned the lights on in my brain. For the wow. first time in my life, I could focus. I went, whoa, this is what normal people feel <laughs> like. And it worked great for a couple of years, but then I started growing tolerant to it. And I panicked because I, I'm going, I finally find something that works and it's going to stop working. I don't think so. So I got to figure this thing out. So now, mind you, there were no websites back then. There were no books on this back then. This is like 16, 17 years ago. And so I ended up on PubMed reading clinical studies. And I found out that dopamine was a, or Ritalin was a dopamine reuptake inhibitor. And if it's not working, maybe I don't have enough dopamine in my brain. Well, how do you fix that? And I found out that L-tyrosine was a precursor to the synthesis of dopamine. So, and during my research, I also found that brain cell signaling was a problem with ADD and ADHD. And that was dependent on, largely on acetylcholine. And so how do you increase acetylcholine? Well, I found that you need two things, either alpha GPC or CDP choline and L-car or acetyl L-carnitine. So there was a GNC around the corner from where we were living in Hollandale Beach at the time. And I got, got put together a little nootropic stack, which is just a combination of supplements. Um, it was L-tyrosine, CDP choline and L-car, brought it home, started using it, Ritalin started working again. Wow. And... And when I would normally typically go through the stimulant crash about four o'clock in the afternoon, if I took these supplements again at four o'clock in the afternoon, I didn't crash. So I've been using the same dose of Ritalin for the last um, 17 years. I've never had to increase. In fact, I decreased my dose a little bit and I've never again grown tolerant to it and I don't crash. And then wow. fast forward a few years and I got deathly ill. I ended up in the ER. It turns out I was hypothyroid. I lost my memory. They tested me for Alzheimer's and dementia and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and I was just desperate again. I did some research and I found out how to get my memory back. It took me about two and a half years. Finally, when I was healthy enough, I started doing, uh, I was writing sales copy. And I started writing sales copy for supplement companies and there was a company in England at the time that had a nootropics, a pre-made nootropic stack. I wrote some advertorials for them, but I was having the hardest time finding information to back up what I was writing about in these sales letters. Mm -hmm. You know, it was just, I had to hunt for these clinical studies because there were no books or websites or anything. And I'm thinking there is, there, there is a need for a resource for anybody to be able to go online and find help for whatever they're dealing with, whether it's anxiety or depression or OCD or PTSD or traumatic brain injury or whatever. And that was the genesis of Nootropics Expert. I started it in late 2015, early 2016, and here we are. Wow. And <laughs> also, I think it's so relevant to talk with you in regards to women as they go through the menopause transition and as these sex hormones like estrogen start declining, it really impacts our neurotransmitters and our brain function and our cognition, and our memory. 
Um, can you, I, I think it'd just be awesome for you to talk a little bit about how you got involved with studying the role of sex hormones and their impact on the brain and brain function and go from there. That's a great, well, when I, I mentioned that I got deathly ill, this was, I don't know, about eight or nine years ago now. And it turned out that I was severely hypothyroid um, and I lost my memory. And but I, at that time, I just felt like I had just problems with just testosterone. My T levels were low. And so I got my labs done and it came out at 799, which for a guy, that's great. You know, it's the range goes from 250 to 1100. And, but I just didn't feel right. It didn't feel good. I finally found a nurse practitioner that's hooked up with life extension here in Fort Lauderdale willing to work with me. And she did my labs again. It came back, you know, 799, 800 for total testosterone. And she injected um, testosterone pellets into my butt. Did my labs again, and my total T levels shot up to 1,300, which is 200 points above what the, the bell curve, right? And so any mainstream urologist would look at that and have a stroke because he, going, he equates that with abusing steroids, like athletes tend to do. But that's where I feel normal. And I find that when I use testosterone, my mood is better, my cognition is better, learning and learning and memory are work. I mean, re my reaction time is better. If I miss my testosterone dose, my wife notices it. She says, did you do your testosterone shot today? <laughs> because it completely changes the way I behave. And wow. so I thought, you know, it, it obviously there's something going on in the brain with these sex hormones. So I did some research and I ended up writing an article on sex hormones in your brain and I found out that there's estrogen and testosterone receptors in your brain. And everything is dependent on these sex hormones. I mean, dopamine, acetylcholine, GABA, serotonin, these won't work properly. Even if you use precursors to increase them, you can have the best nootropic stack on the world specifically tailored for Kim, and it's not going to work as well if you haven't got enough estrogen. And that is so good because there's so much controversy about estrogen. Just in general, I feel like it's often demonized because, of course, obviously we don't want too much of it because um, then it can be harmful. Yep. But talk about estrogen and the protection that it offers for our blood vessels, the elasticity of our blood vessels, nitric oxide. Um the effects on the brain, it makes total sense why when we start to have that decline, why we start having difficulty concentrating and brain fog and memory and all of those things, it all starts in the brain. Yeah, yeah. Well, the thing, DHEA um, comes into play here. And what studies have found is that in, men produce it in their testicles and adrenal glands and women produce it in their ovaries and adrenal glands and but when women go through menopause your ovaries no longer produce dhea or estrogen and that <laughs> that causes problems um, i came across an amazing clinical study that was in the journal fertility and sterility and it was published in april 2002 uh, DHEA, a springboard hormone for female sexuality. And this, this study takes a deep dive into all of the sex hormones, and particularly DHEA and DHEAS uh, in women, right from when you're born to when you're going through puberty, going through your teens and your early 20s, after you have a kid, and then when you hit menopause, what happens? And then they've got studies that were done where they supplemented, gave people supplements with DHEA, both men and women, and um, it turned things around. It's just an incredible study. I'll send you the link to it. Yeah, that'd be great. So, well, why don't you tell me what is DHEA and the difference between DHEA and DHEAS? DHEA is, um, it's often called the youth hormone. It's the most abundant hormone uh, precursor in your body, in the human body, and it's the source of all of your sex hormones. And um, DHEA is the most common natural steroid found in um, human blood plasma. It decreases by 80% between the ages 25 and 75. 
and DH deficiency is suspected in many age-related health issues, including declines in brain and nervous system function. And the latest research shows that DHEA supplementation can have powerful neuroprotective effects. Uh, in fact, it, testing DHEA levels has been a way to predict how long somebody's going to live. That's that's wild. <laughs> Which is kind of wild. Yeah. Okay. What is the um, what is the difference? Okay, so DHEA. Tell me what happens to DHEA when we take it. What does it convert to? What is the difference between how it affects men and how it affects women once we take it? Well, it's uh, in your testes or adrenal glands. Um, it's a precursor to DHT and testosterone in men, and it's a precursor to estrogen in women. So it can activate both androgen and estrogen receptors. And now besides making DHEA, your adrenal glands also produce cortisol, which is in direct competition with DHEA for production. So cortisol is your stress hormone. So if you're really stressed out uh, and your cortisol levels spike, your DHE levels, DHEA levels are going to drop even in a younger person. Okay. Right. And like I mentioned earlier, DHEA declines as we get older between ages 25 to 30. Uh, and then 75, your, by 75, your DHE levels drop by 80%, um, according to the clinical studies. So, and so this age related variation in DHEA production has led scientists to believe that DHEA could be linked to the aging process itself. Um, athletes so what happens with, I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, no. So with chronic stress, that burnout phase, mm -hmm. is it ideal to take DHEA? Yeah, because you're not able to produce it because cortisol is kind of like winning the battle. Mm -hmm. And that's addressed directly in this, um, in this study that I mentioned. Okay. You've even got pictures what about on how it works. So it start, starts out with hydrocortisone and then cortisone and DHEA. What about um, DHEA and let me get this real quick. Uh, what about, I lost my thing here. Hold on. DHEA and um, what was I going to ask you? What was I going to ask you? I think I'm having menopause brain fog. Um, oh, DHEA and the, what are some of the reasons that you would not want to take it? The side effects and can it be harmful for one to take? Anything can be harmful if you take too much. Um, the, I've got a, uh, I wrote, when I wrote my review on DHEA in the, in the side effects, um, if you're planning on supplement su supplementing with DHEA, it's you need to get your labs done every now and again to find out what your levels are because you don't want to use too much and you don't want to use too little either. But because if your hormone levels are normal, for example, and you start using DHEA, you could experience side effects like acne and hair loss, tumor formation, heart arrhyth arrhythmia, and insomnia. And so you've got to, when you're using hormones like this, you've got to be paying attention and using the dose that's right for you and working with a doctor that's willing to work with you, you know, and do your labs and so that you're not overdoing it or underdoing it. Yeah. I've had quite a few patients with really elevated levels of DHEA and having what? symptoms of um, like feeling more aggressive, irritable, mm -hmm. um, Angry, <laughs> just Are angry. Using DHEA as a supplement? Well, no, I, I no, hmm. no. Uh, one lady, this is interesting. When we talk about guidance on needing to test your levels, um, my lady had an elevated level, but just went to the drugstore or the uh, supplement store, and they recommended her taking that DHEA. I was like, that's why you can't just go take stuff. You just you have to guide you know your body. You have to have your levels checked to know if this is right for you, mm -hmm. because what is the risk of hormone sensitive cancers with DHEA? Is there a risk? It um, can cause um, tumor growth, 
from as far as I can see. Now, I'm not a doctor. I've never played one on TV. I don't pretend to have any kind of a medical degree. It's just everything I learn is based on reading the research and clinical studies and and talking to people. Um, But one of the things that did come up is if you've got cancer or you had cancer and it's in remission, you've got to be careful about the hormones you're using because it can instigate tumor growth. Yeah, that's, that's important to know. No, um, if you've never had listening. cancer, if you've never had cancer, um, so and you're not dealing with it, then it should not be a problem. But it's just something that you need to pay attention to, you know? Right. Um, I found it interesting that in women who were experiencing infertility and poor egg quality, they were given DHEA, mm-hmm. and it improved both. Which is addressed in this clinical study that I was talking about. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. And that's good to know. And it's it's wild how they figured that out and how it's probably helped so many people in that area. Just that simple thing. Um, this study says placebo-controlled studies have demonstrated that DHEA has functioned as diverse as the capacity to bolster bone density in postmenopausal women. Uh, in attenuating the um, disabling symptoms of lupus. Um, This particular article just focuses on the new evidence surrounding uh, DHEA um, and and human sexuality, but um, it's certainly something worth considering if you're low in DHEA or you're you know, if you've got, if you've tried everything else and you've used supplements to try to boost your mood and to reduce anxiety and reduce depression and none of that is working, take a look at your hormones. Right. Test them. I know a test lot of, them. a lot of my patients say their pri- their provider won't test them. I'm like, what's wrong with just Find testing somebody who's them. willing to. And the easiest right. way to do that is just Google um, hormone replacement specialist near me. And you should get, if you're living in a relatively populated place, you should get several um, results in the search results and then just read the user reviews before you call anybody. Yeah. You know? Yeah, um, that's that's what I do. And I'm telling you, it is definitely a need and there's definitely a knowledge gap surrounding it. Um, let me ask you as far as, um, well, let me tell you what I use sometimes use DHEA for is I use vaginal DHEA for mm-hmm. um, because of all the receptors down in the vaginal and urinary tract for painful sex and sexual function. It improves that for women and it's that's a great use for it and it's local. It's not systemic, but still it improves both of those parameters. So that's an option of how to use it. Well, and that's one of the things that I address in my article on DHEA, because it's when you take it as a supplement, not all of it is used. Um, But one of the ways to get around that is by using a topical form of DHEA. And you want to put it on, apply it to someplace that's got thinner skin, like your inner thigh um, or your perineum or like you met, mentioned around your vagina or for men right underneath the around your, your uh, testicles, you could also put it under your arm. That's got thinner skin to make sure that more gets into your system. Um, what is the difference between DHEA and keto DHEA? Have you heard of keto DHEA? I've heard of keto DHEA and I'm not sure. Um I'm aware of DHEAS, which is DHEA sulfate, um, but I'm not familiar. I can't remember. I did look up keto uh, DHEA once upon a time, and I can't remember what I found. (laughs) It popped up because um, people were using it for weight loss. And I think the difference is it doesn't convert. I don't believe it has the same conversion. So I don't know how that works. I just thought I would ask you about it because I've had patients want to take keto DHEA and I'm like, okay, it says it's supposed to not convert to estrogen or testosterone, but I don't know how that works. And I don't know how to recommend that um, for weight loss. I don't know. I know everybody wants to take something to lose weight, but I just wondered if you knew anything about it. I'm sorry. I don't. Yeah, that's okay. Um, so what is the dose? What is the typical dose for DHEA? 
Um, 25 to 50 milligrams. Um, I personally use 100 milligrams a day because my DHA levels were low. So um, the recommended adult dose is 25 to 50 milligrams, but then you get a, you need to get your labs done and find out what how much you've got in your system after you supplement it for a few, with it for, for a few weeks. Um, okay. And then increase it or decrease it depending on what your labs say. Do you take it in the morning? Does it matter if you take it with I, food no, or divided doses? I, I take it in the morning. Okay. Okay. Why don't you talk a little bit about estrogen? Like we were just mentioning, you you gave some really interesting information on estrogen. Um, if you could just speak to estrogen, you know, where it comes from, what it does and signs of decline briefly. And then what did you find as far as the role with multiple sclerosis and schizophrenia and estrogen therapy? Okay. Um, well, in women, Estrogen in, in, with men is, is made from testosterone, but in women, the production of estrogen starts out with the synthesis of pregnenolone from cholesterol and fecal cells in your ovaries. Then pregnenolone is then converted to progesterone, which is then converted to testosterone through aromatase, which produces estradiol. And then a small amount of estrogen is also released by your adrenal glands and fat cells. And in your brain, estradiol is produced from cholesterol and neurons and astrocytes and follows a similar pattern of synthesis from your ovaries. So that's how it happens with women. So it makes sense when you think about the symptoms of decline with estrogen, what's going on in our brain. What did you find um, with the studies with estradiol replacement on the effects of schizophrenia and multiple sclerosis? Um, that estrogen for schizophrenia, uh, research shows that schizophrenia appears to be caused by a change or an imbalance in levels of dopamine and serotonin. There was a randomized double blind study conducted at the School of Psychology and Psychiatry in Melbourne, Australia, it had 102 women with schizophrenia. Half of the women received a um, 100 milligram transdermal estradiol patch or a transdermal placebo daily for 28 days. And then symptoms were assessed weekly. The study found that the addition of 100 milligrams of transdermal estradiol significantly reduced the symptoms of schizophrenia during the 28-day trial compared with the women receiving um, antipsychotic medication alone. And the study authors concluded that estradiol appears to be a useful treatment for women with schizophrenia and may provide a new adjunctive therapeutic option for severe mental illness. And then there was one for multiple sclerosis. They noticed that multiple sclerosis patients who became pregnant experienced a significant decrease in relapses that may be caused by a shift in immune response. Animal studies of multiple sclerosis showed that estradiol can decrease disease, disease symptoms. And when treatment stopped, symptoms went back to pretreatment levels. So there was a double-blind randomized study that was done in cooperation with 16 medical centers across Canada and the U.S. between 2007 and 2014. 164 women aged 18 to 50 years with multiple sclerosis were randomly assigned 8 milligrams of oral estradiol um, with uh, some kind of an acetate, glatam, uh, glataramir acetate daily or a placebo. And the study concluded that estradiol plus this um, glatamir acetate reduced multiple sclerosis relapse, relapse rates and were well tolerated. Glataramir wow. acetate. I'm not sure what that is, but they added. I know. I saw that. I wasn't sure either. <laughs> I should have looked that up. I just, I was yeah. like, I just, I just saw the estradiol part and I thought, wow. And that's bioidentical estrogen mm -hmm. body, like identical estrogen that they used estradiol. I found it interesting and I didn't know until I started to be um, become more familiar with menopause and the body and getting certified that there's actually estrogen is a group of hormones and there's three different types. Mm -hmm. And it, it's so interesting because estrone is the one that's produced after menopause or post menopause and estradiol is our most potent estrogen during the reproductive years. And then there's estriol that yeah. is most potent during pregnancy. I just, that was so interesting to know that. And that can help gauge your therapy moving forward. Um, but I'm a fan of bioidentical estrogen if 
your candidate and it is it possible because we need it. There's so many beneficial things for us that it yeah. does, um, especially like you're talking about the brain. And I just found that so fascinating and important for women to know that, that are suffering with like multiple sclerosis or schizophrenia. I mean, I'm sure there's a lot of other things that go into that, but mm-hmm. I just found that so interesting, that connection. Um, and then testosterone, it's interesting because Actually, it's very potent in the female body. I know it's always often considered a male hormone, but testosterone is very important for women. And a lot of people just think about it as sexual function, libido, but the role of testosterone is many. Um, so could you just talk about a little bit of the role of testosterone in females and um, what sure. studies have found with testosterone? Yep. Um, there has been, um, well, age related decline in sex hormones occur in both men and women, obviously, and is associated with declines in cognition and memory. Testosterone supplementation in older men has been shown in multiple studies to improve cognition and memory. There was a study done at the University of Washington that recruited 57 healthy older men. They received weekly injections of 50, 100, or 300 milligrams of testosterone uh, or a placebo for six weeks. Uh, the research has concluded that moderate increases in testosterone, but not low or high, so um, um, 100 milligrams and not 50 or 300, resulted in improved cognition and memory. Now, there's other studies in young men in low testosterone, so supplementation improved reasoning, working in spatial and verbal memory. Um, and these studies suggest that optimal levels of these sex hormones can support working memory and cognition of men of any age. Um, there was another study done with testosterone and depression in men. And they found that testosterone replacement therapy was effective in reducing depression in men. And then there have been studies with progesterone um, reducing the effectiveness of ADHD meds. And this was done with men and women. There was a trial. I was going to ask with, you about that. I'm sorry? Yeah, I was going to ask you about that. Yeah. Um, women with ADHD are op- often find that ADHD stimulant meds are not as effective during the last two weeks of their menstrual cycle. And in the first two weeks of your cycle, estrogen levels increase and you find that your ADHD meds are effective. Now, but during the last two weeks of your cycle, estrogen levels drop and progesterone levels increase and your meds don't work as well. Now, the effectiveness of your ADHD meds vary because estrogen plays a role in the creation and plasticity of midbrain neurons, the areas of your brain used for decision making and emotional and social behavior. Um, and this was demonstrated during a trial with Um, The healthy young women aged 25 to 26 years, the researchers wanted to know what Adderall feels like when estrogen is increased. So there's one group of women received estradiol patches with with 10 milligrams of Adderall, and the other group used Adderall only. And the study participants were in the first two weeks of their menstrual cycle. The team found the combo of an increase in estrogen along with the stimulant use increased the effects of the stimulant. Higher levels of estrogen and lower levels of progesterone are associated with increased effectiveness of stimulant meds in both men and women. And then there was another study that suggested ADHD meds may need to be used at varying dosage throughout the menstrual cycle for optimal symptom control in women. That's interesting because yeah. I didn't know that. And that's really good information because, yeah, it just shows you the effects of these hormones are greater than we thought. Um, with progesterone, since we're talking about it, and then I want to get back to boosting testosterone, um, progesterone, we often think about as just protecting our endometrium and protecting a pregnancy, but talk about a little bit about, if you can, about progesterone's effects on the brain. Um, luteinizing hormone stimulates the production of pregnenolone, which is then converted to DHEA. Um, DHA converts to testosterone, some of which is then converted to DHT, um, also synthesized by various enzymes in neurons and glial cells in your brain. Um, I'm looking for pregnenolone and where it comes in in this cycle. Um, preg- uh, here we are. Women, the production of estrogen starts with the synthesis of pregnenolone from cholesterol and fecal cells in your ovaries. And pregnenolone is then converted to progesterone. 
which is then converted to testosterone through aromatase, which produces estradiol. A small amount of estrogen is also re released by your adrenal glands and fat cells. And in your brain, estradiol is produced from cholesterol in neurons and astrocytes, follows a similar pattern to the synthesis in your ovaries. So it seems to me that if you use progesterone as a supplement, it would then be converted into testosterone, which then would be converted into estradiol. I think that's something to think about when in menopause, you know, we, you know, women without a uterus often are not given progesterone, but in my mind and what I've studied is there's so many more benefits that it would be a good thing to give progesterone even without a uterus. Mm -hmm. I mean, the effects and also how it affects the brain and the GABA receptors, um, calming. I think of progesterone as our calming hormone, um, when it declines, you start to have things like sleep disturbances and anxiety, um, even intrusive thoughts with progesterone decline. So I find that really interesting on the impact of progesterone on our brain. Uh, and getting back to testosterone, I just run, ran across some something else that I was um Testosterone is critical for women's health and cognition. It's produced in your ovaries by fecal um, internal cells in response to luteinizing hormone. Testosterone then occurs at estrogen. Even though men produce seven to eight times more testosterone, women also require it for healthy menstruation, sexual desire, red blood cell production, and bone and tissue mass. Yeah, it does a lot. How do you feel? How do you recommend boosting testosterone? If, if people don't want to take testosterone or don't feel comfortable taking it, how do you, what is your recommendations for boosting testosterone? Talk them into, using, talk, talk them into using testosterone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But it, 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 it appears that you could use pro, um, progesterone because per, progesterone is then converted into testosterone, which is then through aromatase produces estradiol. And so. this is natural micronized progesterone. This is not synthetic. We're talking about bioidentical, body identical, natural We're progesterone. Because there is, yes. Yeah, yeah. It, there's, there's such a difference in what the synthetic progestins do versus progesterone. Um, so it's important to mention that um, what, as far as nootropics, do you recommend if patients or people want to use that to boost testosterone levels? How is, ashwagandha, is ashwagandha one? I know that works for a lot of different things, but I, I was remembering you had um, just like a little stack that you could take to help boost testosterone. I know a lot of people are looking for alternatives. And then nootropic supplements to regulate estrogen. Oh, that'd um, be great too. Yeah. Um, vitamin D. Studies show that a relationship in vitamin D levels and sperm volume and sperm count and motility. Uh, vitamin D also seems to be involved in testosterone production. Uh, there was a study done with men. Uh, 165 men aged 20 to 49 years divided into two groups. One received uh, 3,332 international units of vitamin D daily for a year in group two of placebo. Total testosterone levels in group one increased by about 25% after supplementing with vitamin D, but testosterone levels in the placebo group remained the same. So just something as simple as vitamin D3. Um, wow. Zinc, a study with 37 patients diagnosed with infertility for five, um, for five years supplemented with zinc. The researchers found that zinc supplementation significantly boosted testosterone and DHT levels. Uh, ashwagandha. Study tested the effects of ashwagandha extract. It, the extract is called KSM 66. 225 milligrams three times a day for 12 weeks with infertile men. Study showed a 17% increase in testosterone levels and 167% increase in sperm count. Wow. Um, the black seed oil, which a lot of people don't know about, two grams per day. There was a study done with 55 infertile men aged 18 to 40 years, divided into two groups. One supplemented with two grams of black seed oil per day for three months. Um, the group of men using black seed oil had a 46.83% increased sperm count, motility, and viability, as well as a 47.46% increase in uh, follicle stimulating hormone and a 32.75% increase in luteinizing hormone. 
and testosterone increased by 29.35%. Wow. Yeah, that was a, a, a biggie. Uh, ginger extract, um, the dosage wasn't disclosed in this study, but ginger extract for 30 weeks resulted in a 17.7% increase, increase in testosterone. Um, fenugreek, 500 milligrams a day, 50 men aged 35 to 67, uh, or 65 supplemented with 500 milligrams of fenugreek uh, for 12 weeks. The result was a 46% increase in free testosterone in the majority of volunteers, including improved mental alertness and mood. And then there's Macuna periens, which we use for getting L-DOPA. A study mm -hmm. conducted in India, 150 fertile men, infertile men, 25 to 40, 75 men supplemented with five grams of Macuna periens every day for three months, the men showed a 41% improvement in sperm count and motility and a 27% increase in testosterone. Uh, DHEA, naturally in, uh, synthesized in your testes, adrenal glands in your brain. It's a precursor to synthesis of testosterone and DHT. It can activate both androgen and estrogen receptors. A meta-analysis of 42 publications de demonstrated that DHA supplementation significantly increased testosterone levels in men and was even more effective in women. Dosage of greater than 50 milligrams per day for 12 weeks was more effective than dosages of less than 50 milligrams per day. Go ahead. And then um, the, there's not a lot for regulating um, estrogen. Um, we've got postmenopausal postmenopausal women with low levels of circulating estrogen can experience brain fog and poor cognition, obesity, metabolic syndrome, cancer, excessive menstrual cramps, pain during intercourse, abnormal heavy menstrual flow, or polycystic ovary syndrome. But recent studies have shown that supporting your microbiome um, can help prevent many of these estrogen modulated diseases. Your microbiome impacts estrogen levels through the secretion of uh, enzyme B glucuron. <laughs> I can't even pronounce it. It's glucuronidase. Thank you, which deconjugates yeah. estrogen, allowing free estrogen to bind to its receptors and preventing many estrogen mediated diseases. Um, That's one reason. In my practice, I will check a stool test on women to look at that beta glucuronidase because if it's elevated, it's been associated with things like breast cancer, or colorectal cancer, and I think in men, even prostate cancer, if I remember. Oh, wow. But what it does is it helps, um, you want to make sure that you're getting rid of estrogen appropriately. Otherwise, if beta glucuronidase is high, it will cause estrogen to be recirculating and cause those estrogen dominant type cancers. So it's really interesting. And it's interesting that you could do a simple stool test that obviously shows the microbiome and inflammation and immunology and that type of thing. But also just to look at that one marker is a great reason to do a stool test. It's really interesting. Then we have soy isoflavone phytoestrogens. Supplementing with phytoestrogen isoflavones extracted from soybeans modulates estrogen metabolism. It has been shown to reduce tumor cells, induce tumor cell apoptosis, and may reduce the risk of breast cancer, heart disease, osteoporosis, and obesity. And then luteolin. 60 milligrams a day in men, luteolin helps regulate aromatase, preventing testosterone from converting into estrogen, um, which is kind of a big deal when you're using estrogen like, or testosterone like me. Um, I actually use Arimidex, two milligrams a week. Uh, most guys just use one milligram a week to keep their estradiol levels um, in check. It appears that you can use luteolin. Yeah, and, that, and the reason you wanna do that is yeah, through that enzyme aromatase, you wanna make sure you're not getting too much testosterone converted to estrogen, raising those levels. So I think that was a great point that you made. Men who are getting testosterone or women, it's a good idea to make sure you're not having too much aromatization to increase your estrogen levels, yep. leading to growth of cancers and that. That's a great point that you brought up. Um, what are you taking for that? I've heard of DIM and um, yeah, DIM is a common supplement people take. I, I used to use DIM when I couldn't get Arimidex. Anyway, Arimidex is used for breast can women breast cancer patients, um, men that are typically using, um, like I use one cc of testosterone a week. I was using one milligram of Arimidex a week. 
Um, and I found that my estradiol levels were still too high. So we increased it to two milligrams and that solved the problem. Is that a prescription or is that? It's a prescription. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That's good to know because yeah, you don't want to, I think that's all of these things that we're talking about with these hormones, you know, it's not as simple as just taking a hormone because you have to think about what it's doing inside the body and what it's impacting and how it's causing these other levels to increase and the risks associated with. So I think that speaks to another great reason to test hormone levels yeah. and monitor them closely when you're supplementing or taking hormone replacement. Um, monitoring therapy, I feel is a crucial thing to do. And it works sure. differently in different people too. Like most yeah. guys can get away with one milligram of um, Arimidex a week to control estrogen. But this body doesn't, it, it needs two milligrams. So it's, you know, and the same goes for supplements for your brain. You know, I've got recommended adult dosages for everything. Uh, there's a range from low to high, but then after that, you've got to figure out what works best for you. Real quick, if you don't mind, do you, could you share um, some new tropics? Because, you know, I talk to a lot of women and they feel like, you know, fatigue and, this type of just living like this is just a normal thing, but I don't feel that's true. I feel like there's obviously something that we can do to boost vitality and energy and our mood. Do you have a recommendation for boosting vitality and energy as far as nootropics go? Sure. Um, you know, it depends on, on somebody's age too, because aging has a lot to do with this. For example, all of our major neurotransmitters decline as we get older. And so dopamine, for example, declines by 10% per decade starting in your early 20s, which means that by the time you're 80, you've got 20% of the dopamine in your brain that you did when you were 21. Um, and this is men and women. And the same thing with uh, serotonin, same thing with GABA, same thing with acetylcholine. All these major neurotransmitters are involved in everything from learning and memory, um, all kinds of uh, um, you know short-term and working memory, long-term memory, um, mood, um, you know, anxiety, depression, it's just increasing these neurotransmitters back to what they're supposed to be is one of the simplest things that a person can do. Um, I, you know, people have remarkable results just by using 500 milligrams of L-tyrosine twice a day to boost dopamine. And then um, for focus, increase acetylcholine, focus and concentration, and learning and memory, increase acetylcholine. So 300 milligrams per day of CDP choline, twice a day, uh, along with L-car, acetyl L-carnitine, 500 milligrams twice a day. That little how combination much, much? right there should help. 500 milligrams of L-car with 300 milligrams of CDP choline. Oh, Everything twice a day, yeah. Because these um, CDP colonies has got a longer half-life, but the other uh, supplements have got a short half-life. Like tyrosine, um, you take the 500 milligrams of L-tyrosine and you take it at 8 o'clock in the morning, it's gone by noon. Oh, wow. It's no longer going to make dopamine. You can the take these three together? Yes. Okay. So you said L-tyrosine 500, um, acetyl alcohol, no, CDP 300. Could you talk about what that is? Because that's really important as we age, the choline, right? I mean, that's sure. a good thing for us women to be taking. Yeah, there's different kinds of choline on the market. Um, you can't, it's illegal to sell acetylcholine. So the same thing, it's, it's, it's illegal to sell serotonin or dopamine, which is the reason why we use precursors. Um, there's a couple of good ways, a relatively safe ways to increase a set of, uh, to increase choline, which is you need the choline molecule to make a set of choline. And then there's a cycle that's involved in producing a set of choline that involves coenzyme A, which is what we use LCAR for. Um, but for the choline molecule, we can get it from either CDP choline, in Europe they call it citocholine, CDP choline, Charlie Delta Papa choline, uh, and or alpha GPC, either one of those two. Now, clinical a, a recent clinical study showed that long term use of alpha GPC is not too safe 
to use. Short-term is fine, but long-term use increases your chance of stroke. So now I recommend oh, wow. just using CDP choline along with LCAR. Now, okay. there are other cofactors involved in the, in the creation of these neurotransmitters. For example, L-tyrosine will not make dopamine if you do not have enough vitamin B6, B9, and B12. Okay. And LCAR and CDP choline will not make acetylcholine without enough vitamin B1 or thiamine and vitamin B5. Mm. Um, and vitamin D and magnesium and vitamin C. Uh, so it's critical that somebody gets a good bioactive multivitamin and or a B complex. And by, by bioactive, I mean not synthetic. So the quickest way to find, figure out whether something, like you, don't use Centrum or one a day. Um, okay. You're looking for like a whole food or a raw food multi, or the one that I prefer is performance, uh, the Performance Lab one. They grow it on different kinds of bacteria and yeast. And then they harvest the nutrients. And so what you end up with is the same types of vitamins and minerals that you get from food. Okay. So um, the quickest way to check a multivitamin to find out whether it's, is look at um, vitamin B9. If it says folic acid, put it back on the shelf. If it says methylfolate, okay. um, then check B12. If it says cyanocobalamin, put it back on the shelf. If it says methylcobalamin, then it's probably a keeper. Uh, vitamin okay. B6, if it says P5P, it's a keeper. If it's peroxidine, it's synthetic, put it back on the shell. Okay, so P5P? So P5P for vitamin B6, methylfolate for vitamin D9, and um, methylcobalamin for vitamin B12. There's a couple okay. of other variations too. Uh, cyanocobalamin is the one you want to stay away from. The cyana is, stands for cyanide. It's actually a cyanide molecule. I can't one? believe they use that. Yeah, they do. That, that's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> that's just that's not right. Acetyl L carnitine is that Alcar? Uh, that's Alcar. Yes, Alcar for sure. Acetyl now, is that also helpful for fat burning? Do you know? It, I was it thinking. helps. It, it it helps with um, metabolism. Okay. It's not known as a fat supplement, but it is involved in me metabolism. Um, it helps transport fatty acids into mitochondria for the synthesis of adenosine triphosphate. Okay, I um, was thinking it was great for our mitochondria, um, and I was it, thinking it, it helps convert fatty acids into the the form that you can use in your mitochondria for energy production. Okay, so, which is also so important as we age when mitochondrial function is declining, especially in our brain, which is another reason why we can have all these neurological symptoms as well. Well, think um, about it. You've got uh, mito, uh, mitochondria, or you've got maybe a thousand in one brain cell. Now, the rest of your, because your brain is just so energy hungry. Yeah. So you've got a ton of, um, a ton of these little critters in there and they are what produce adenosine triphosphate or ATP, which is your master energy supply during the day. And so if your uh, mitochondria are, are dysfunctional for some reason, either they're not getting enough of what they need to make adenosine triphosphate, or you're not taking care of scavenging free radicals and keeping inflammation down, um, it, you start killing these little critters or killing brain cells or damaging neurons and dendrites and synapses. And so we just use some supplements so that we can make more adenosine triphosphate and make more mitochondria. And the simplest way to do that is Alcar, um, alpha, okay. uh, alpha lipoic acid, uh, CoQ10, and PQQ. That little stack right there is an energy stack. What was the last one? PQQ. Tell me about that. PQQ is, um, they actually found it, um, they call it um, the um, angel dust or something because um, PQQ was found in space. Um, where's my study on PQQ? Here you are. So you said acetyl L-carnitine, alpha lipoic acid, PQQ, Co and what else? CoQ10 and PQQ. CoQ10 and PQQ. Okay. Okay, um, PQQ is, um, 
kind of unique when it comes to supplements because it's one of the only ways that I know of to increase the number of mitochondria. Huh. There are plenty of other supplements that help increase um, mitochondrial functionality, so increasing the synthesis of ATP or adenosine triphosphate, but increasing the number of mitochondria means even more energy. And okay, so yeah. P PQQ can do that. Um, PQQ and also helps clean up free radicals and reduces oxidative stress um, in brain tissue. It stimulates the production of nerve, gro nerve growth factor. Um, mm -hmm. Nerve growth factor and brain-derived nootropic factor are two nerve growth factors, proteins in your brain that are needed for neuroplasticity. So growing new wow. neurons or repairing damaged neurons or repairing damaged axons or synapses or um, dendrites. Um, so low dose of PQQ, like 10 milligrams, um, two okay. or three times a day. Um, alpha lipoic acid is 100 milligram, one to 200 milligrams um, once or twice a day. And then CoQ10 is, well, it depends on what you're treating. Um, PQQ works in synergy with CoQ10. Oh, okay. To make and ATP, CoQ10, to make ATP. it's also, um, that one you also want to take, I think, in divided doses, maybe um, maybe 100 to 300 milligrams a day. Yeah, maybe. Some, of, some of them you can do in divided doses um, because but then things like CoQ10 are fat soluble, so it doesn't really matter. Um, if you're okay. doing it every day, consistently daily, um, you're going to end up building your levels up. So it doesn't really matter when you take it. Um, some of this stuff is water soluble, which is like the amino acids, like L-tyrosine is water soluble. So um, you need to dose it throughout the day to keep nice, even levels. Okay. But the fat soluble ingredients, you can do it. You can take um, your daily dose all in one dose and you'll be fine as long as you're doing it every day. Okay. Do you need to pulse these or can you just take them every day all the time or they, should they be stuck so for a certain amount? So long as you're using the recommended adult dosage, there's no reason to cycle them. You can okay. use them every day. Okay. Um, now there are tests that you can do for some of these, like your vitamin D levels. It's important that you test it to make sure that you're using the right amount. Um, but vitamin D is actually considered a hormone. Um, so you can test your vitamin D levels. Um, not sure if you can test your CoQ10 levels. I think you can. I think you can. Yeah, uh, yeah, I think that one you can. And by the way, the other two neurotransmitters that also decline are serotonin and, and um, GABA. To increase GABA, you just you, you use GABA. You use GABA. Um, is it PharmaGABA? Is that what it is? I prefer PharmaGABA because PharmaGABA is made by a Japanese company. They synthesize, they make it on using Lactobacillus hilgardii bacteria, and then they harvest the GABA from it. And it's the same form of GABA that you naturally produce in your gut. So you can take a lower dose, like 250 or 300 milligrams. Okay. Um, regular GABA, plain old GABA is synthetic GABA, and you have to use a much higher dose to and hope that some of it gets into your brain. Farben GABA, there's no problem. It readily gets crosses the blood-brain barrier. Does it matter which brand you're using of Pharma GABA or? Well, the supplement companies buy the, they license Pharma GABA from that Japanese company. Okay. So, um, but that's a good question. You want to, I, when I'm looking for supplements, I want purity and mm -hmm. I don't want garbage in, you know, included in my supplements. So I do my best to, uh, to avoid supplements that have got silicon dioxide in them and magnesium stearate and um, pink number, red number three and pink number seven and all this other stuff that manufacturers put in the supplements. They use it during the manufacturing process. So it helps the manufacturer, but it doesn't help you. Uh, and they're actually toxic. Right. So look for uh -huh. a PharmaGaba supplement if you can find it that is just PharmaGaba. Can you take it every day? Yes. Okay. And is it taken at night or because I'm thinking I, I like taking, or yeah, I like it taking it at night because it helps me sleep. Um, you can okay. also take it during the day. If it may, if you take it during the day and it makes you so sleepy, then just switch it to taking it 60 to 90 minutes before bed. Um, to, to increase you, uh, serotonin, I'm sorry. Oh yeah, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. To increase serotonin, use tryptophan. 
L-tryptophan 500 milligrams, and I prefer taking that before bed because serotonin goes on to make melatonin. Oh, yeah, that um, makes sense. I don't recommend using melatonin as a supplement for sleep. Um, it, I react really badly to it, even one milligram. Um, I, you can't live with me. Um, but using tryptophan is a perfectly safe way to increase melatonin. Wow. Can you combine these? Like, say, can you take something with tryptophan and pharmagaba? And I also like like L-theanine. Can you combine all these? Yeah, uh, my, my sleep stack that I take about 90 minutes before bed is 400 milligrams of magnesium biglycinate, um, 500 milligrams of L-tryptophan, 400 milligrams of L-theanine, 300 milligrams of pharmagaba, um, 200 milligrams of lemon balm. Lemon balm is a GABA, GABA transaminase inhibitor, uh, which means that when you inhibit that enzyme, you, your brain ends up reusing the GABA that's already there. So it's support, it's it's uh, potentiating the pharmagaba that I'm using as a supplement. Um, and that's 200 milligrams? Yeah, I use a low dose of lemon balm. I love lemon balm, but it also affects thyroid hormone and I'm severely hypothyroid. So if I take any yeah. more than that, it really messes with um, messes with the dosage that I need to use for my meds. Okay, that's good to know. So magnesium glycinate, 400 milligrams, 500 of uh, L-tryptophan, 400 of, what'd you say? L-theanine. L-theanine, and then 300 of pharmagaba and 200 mm -hmm. of lemon balm. Yeah. A lot of people use 400 That's... milligrams of lemon balm that haven't got thyroid issues. Okay. I love lemon balm. Wish I could use That's that. a great sleep stack. Now that stack, I still woke up two or three times a night. So I added CBD oil. That solved okay. the problem. Wow. What do you know about taurine? I've heard a lot about taurine. Um, it's been like recommended that taurine, magnesium, and you may not know this, B6 for hot flashes. Apparently that's a really good combination to help women with hot flashes. So I think that's pretty interesting. Um, taurine, I always thought about it as an energy drink, so I wasn't real sure about its benefits, but apparently it's got a lot of great benefits for us. Do you know anything there about actually, there, there have been studies done around the world and they found that populations with higher taurine levels, the people live longer. Wow. Because it increases stem cells and progenitor cells in your wow. brain, including the hippocampus. Um, wow. So taurine functions as a neurotransmitter and a neuromodulator in your brain. It activates GABA and glycine receptors, which affects memory and mood and prevents seizures. Uh, taurine protects brain cells by reducing intracellular free calcium concentration concentrations. Um, it's a very potent antioxidant and protects mitochondrial dis from mitochondrial dysfunction. It modulates energy metabolism within cells. It modulates genes to induce longevity. It inhibits cellular stress associated with Alzheimer's. It acts as a quality control in brain cell health. And it protects against stroke. Wow. Is there a dose listing? I think you can go pretty high on it, like maybe 3,000 milligrams or something. I, I can't remember. I, I, use, I, I use 2,000 milligrams a day, 1,000 milligrams in the morning and 1,000 milligrams at noon. Oh, okay. So you do it in the morning. Yeah. And at noon. Okay. Is that Performance Lab again, or what brand do you use? Uh, the brand that I use of Taurine is, you know, right off the top of my head, I can't remember the brand. I just know that it's pure Taurine and they haven't got anything else in it. And I haven't okay. got the, the bottle is in the closet behind me, so I don't want to go get up and go and get it. But yeah, no, that's okay. That's okay. Can you combine that then with the other stuff safely that you take? The other stuff that can we combine these? Because I know it's I take all of like my stuff when I use my uh, my morning stack. Um, I take everything at the same time with a tablespoon of unrefined coconut oil. And oh, okay. the reason why I use unrefined coconut oil is because the fat soluble ingredients in that stack. Um, you need to activate your fat digestion uh, if you don't. That's the reason why some, um, it says uh, take it with food. 
what they're implying is that there's your food is going to have some healthy fat in it that's going to activate bile acids and um, pancreatic enzymes to digest this fat. And if you don't do that, um, if you don't take it with food, then I get around that by just using a tablespoon of unrefined coconut oil. But you can use any healthy oil. Uh, you can use unrefined oil. coconut oil. Unrefined coconut oil. You can use extra virgin olive oil. You can use walnut oil. Um, if if worse came to worse, you could use a tablespoon of peanut butter. So wow. long as you activate okay. that cellular digestion or the the, the fat digestion. Um, then my body uses those fat soluble ingredients and then the water soluble ingredients just take care of themselves. So I down everything with a glass of water and a tablespoon of unrefined coconut oil. Okay. Yeah. I was going to ask you, so you just drink the water, drink this, take the supplement and then yep. you do that last. Yeah. And that was one tablespoon or teaspoon tablespoon. And it doesn't taste gross. Uh, unrefined coconut oil takes a little bit by co like coconuts. Okay, good. I'm going to try. I am definitely going to try that. And I'm definitely going to get on some taurine. And I'm definitely going to get on the uh, choline you mentioned, because mm -hmm. I've read a lot of great things about that. Um, thank you so much for sharing all this. You are just a wealth of knowledge. And I just have really enjoyed talking with you. And I learned so much. And I just love to share your expertise. Because again, you provide evidence-based peer-reviewed information, which is so important, especially when you think about what we're putting into our bodies and how it's impacting other things. It's just, you are a wealth of knowledge. So thank you so much for talking with me. And could you just share where people can find you and what your YouTube channel is? Uh, Nootropics Expert. Um, just search for NootropicsExpert.com. That's N-O-O -O, Tropics, like living in the tropics, NootropicsExpert.com um is my website um that is a brand new website too it was just redesigned so it's easier to use easier to navigate um, my youtube channel nootropics is nootropics expert i've got hundreds of videos on that channel and a uh, 121,000 subscribers i think so far so it's a popular youtube channel and my book head first the second edition is I think everybody, every doctor needs, every psychiatrist needs a copy of that book. <laughs> I totally agree. And I don't know if you remember or not, but you sent me a copy and I just was so grateful. That was just so kind. And I, I love it. I'm serious. It's just unbelievable. Again, the information you share and the, the knowledge and the evidence behind it. It's so great. What's next for you? What are you working on and what, what are your future goals? Where are you headed? Um, I was talking to somebody in Los Angeles about doing um, a movie based on the book. Oh. Um, um, I've got the Miami Book Fair coming up in a couple of weeks. I'm doing a book signing at that. Um, that's in a um, couple of, I think that's in early in November. Um and hopefully this is um, broken the ice and I'm getting back into podcasting again. Um, so I really enjoy doing this. I'm on a radio show once a month um, with uh, Joshua Lane and in Los Angeles, which is distributed to a bunch of radio stations on the West Coast. Um, just taking it as it comes. It <laughs> yeah. People keep on throwing some opportunity. And I do personal consultations too. If somebody needs some help trying to figure out what supplements to take for whatever they're dealing with, um, there's a link to, you can easily find my calendar on my website. Uh, it's a link to the calendars in the notes section of all of my YouTube videos. Um, and if you don't, you can get a free copy of Secrets of the Optimized Brain, which is a hundred pages and it's got 92 of the most popular nootropics used today. So wow. that's a freebie. Yeah. And I appreciate you too, because it's been a while since I've done a podcast. So just helping me get back into it too. I'm just looking forward to jumping back in. And yeah, I was just I'm like, I've got to talk to you about DHEA and some of these other things because you are, like I said, the go-to. Um, well, that's awesome. I'm so I'm thrilled for you and what has, you know, what your next steps are. And I hope I hope to talk to you again, because like I said, it's Let's been great. again. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. I wish the best of luck to you and take care. Good luck with thank everything. Thank you for having me again, Kim. And it was good to see you.